and the experience from us. Well, so we have uh, four guest speakers from industry partners, and then we have a uh, special guest uh, from the Circle of Australia, so Lisa McLean. She will give us an uh, overview of the circular economy. Please join me welcoming the speech. Thanks so much, Sean, and our Minister, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Dignitaries, thank you for having me here today. I'd also like to recognise the traditional custodians on the land on which we gather, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present, and emerging and Indigenous uh, people here today. I'd also like to recognise um, the special role that our First Nations people have played in terms of being the architects and driving circular economy for millennia in Australia. And we've got a lot to learn from them and I look forward to their voice in Parliament. So with 10 billion people on the planet by 2050, we simply can't continue to consume the way we are. And we've been discussing that already this morning. The taking, making, wasting uh, approach um, is really not going to work. We're running out of finite resources. There's now more gold and silver in a tonne of uh, iPhones than a tonne of ore from a gold or silver mine. So if you're in the business of extracting gold or silver, or you need it for your production line, you can see that into the future, there's some serious changes that you as a business and other businesses are going to need to take to participate and continue to uh, participate in the global economy. We don't also just have one crisis with carbon emissions. We actually have a few. And it's great we've got a new government here and it's fantastic to see Senator talking about that ambition, and we've finally got action now and an agenda on climate change, which is fantastic around carbon emissions. But we also have a huge crisis around biodiversity loss, and of course, um, the depletion of natural resources. And that is about our consumption model. So rethinking how we get what we need uh, in a way that does not always mean owning it or throwing it away, using it for a short time, is really going to be the centrepiece of the new economy, making critical changes to keep resources in the economy for as long as possible at their highest value is where a lot of that untapped economic opportunity lies. And of course, the um, ARC NICE um, hub is really a critical, has a really critical role to play in helping businesses and communities and individuals make this transition to a circular economy by getting those nutrients uh, back into use at their highest value. So it's incredibly important work that we're all here today to support. The circular economy has really emerged as a global framework to enable the world to tackle these multiple crises. Um, the definition that we use at Circular Australia is the circular economy decouples economic growth from the consumption of finite resources, designing waste and pollution out of the system and it's based on three principles. Design out waste and pollution at every stage of production in, in um, use and end of life. Two, keep materials in the economy at their highest use for as long as possible, at their highest value rather, for as long as possible, and regenerate natural systems. For example, through water recycling, removing toxic uh, components from our um, environment, tree planting, organic recycling and so forth. And Circular Australia also supports um, an Australian circular economy that matches environmental goals with surf, uh, social ambitions. So in a resource and carbon constrained future, there, there simply won't be economic progress without us making these changes to keep resources in the economy for as long as possible. And it's actually really gritty work. We are going to have to rethink things like this fantastic project has today about what our resources are and where we get them from. So through design, ensuring things are made to be recycled and can be broken down at end of use, uh, enabling our resources once extracted to keep going round and round like they are in this project, not landfilling them, not flushing them away, but getting value from them and designing them to stay in the economy as long as possible. So this in turn does create jobs, as we've heard from the Minister, and you know, it also creates enormous revenue opportunities for businesses that are prepared to, to take this approach and be the leaders in their field. And we're seeing many of you sitting here today that are backing this project. 
And at Circular Australia, we support the nine R's, and there could even be 10 with regulation. And it starts with refusing things that come into our economy. So how do we design out the PFAS, the other toxins and components that can't be pollutants and can't, uh, components that can't be broken down or recycled? How do we rethink things, redesign things to last? How do we reduce our use uh, to ensure that we're not wasting? Reusing, repairing, refurbishing that part of the economy is a really critical part of the demand side as we start to transition to, to circular economy in Australia. Remanufacturing, of course, is, is just going to be phenomenal. We've got the Made in Australia agenda, uh, the modern manufacturing uh, approach, uh, which is and made, uh, made in Australia by Australia, which is uh, from the Albanese government, which is going to be so important to back this new transition to a circular economy and to build that resilience and expertise here. We've also got repur the repurposing Recycling and recovery are uh, all part of the circular economy and, and the, the uh, tenth is actually regulation if we add that in. So it's not just about looking at sort of the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff in terms of burning our waste or just, um, you know, dealing with those um, organics in landfill and other things. We've also got to look up that hierarchy and think how do we design, redesign um, the way we um, produce components how do we redesign homes to extract value like this through toilet systems and other things? You know, how can we start to create uh, an economy that's going to keep these materials going round and round to extract value? And as I said, it's also about saying no to the things that we can't have in our economy. It's really exciting to have seen the communique from environment ministers led by uh, Tanya Plibersek a couple of weeks ago committing to circular economy. For circular nerds like us, it was a big celebration. Um, the 2030 target to work with the private sector to drive a circular economy is going to really catalyse action and change. And it's, it's been well needed leadership from um, federal government. And this comes with a focus on building Australian made uh, is we're seeing catalyzing lots of opportunities. One thing we know about the circular economy transition is no one organisation can make this transition on its own. We need to work collaboratively across government, business and research and that's why we've set up Circular Australia. We were New South Wales Circular and now we've grown into Circular Australia to handhold and encourage the participation of different sectors to work together to drive outcomes. Uh, like the outcomes of this of this um, uh, nice hub, so I'd like to um, we and I'd like to say that we need researchers like Sean, Stefano, and other other universities here today um, with the leadership leadership of UTS. We need their talented teams to solve these gritty problems um, to transitioning from a linear to a circular economy and a circular future. So I commend your work, and I'm just thrilled that Circular Australia is involved. Um, and we're happy to be a collaborative partner and support this project as much as we can. So thank you, everybody, for having us. Thank you, Lisa, for the wonderful talk. And uh, we look forward to working together in the, yeah, our hope to the Southland Australia. The next speaker, I'd like to invite Gary Lisson uh, from the OCP, Organic Crop Protect. They have been involved in our fertilizer application. So he will share about uh, what about our body line to produce from urine. Yes, extremely welcoming in the, his uh, presentation. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, I guess um, Yates, Julex Group, um, we're on the con consumption side of things, and um, yeah, we've been brought in, I guess, to, to give an understanding of with consumers um, the whole perception of using urine in, in a garden or in a food food scenario. So yeah, it's a big challenge for us, but anyway, we're here for the challenge. I'd like to um, also begin to acknowledge the, um, the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, uh, past, present and emerging. Uh, special guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honour um, to be with you today to celebrate um, two important events, actually, uh, to plan an opening of uh, Nutrients in a Circular Economy to coincide with um, Use Less Stuff Day. Yes, it is a thing. Um, it's a stroke of genius, so uh, hats off to you guys. Um, I've been involved uh, in the organic farming and agricultural industry for about 30 years um, with 
the company I started, which is Organic Crop Protectants, uh, yeah, over 30 years ago. Um, no industry is more important, I guess, than the production of uh, safe and nutrient-dense food. Uh, but as a result of the way we've approached uh, the production and consumption of food in our, our society, uh, no time has it been uh, more challenging to put food where it needs to be at affordable prices uh, while regenerating our farmlands and fixing our climate. This really is the transformational challenge uh, we face uh, for our future prosperity. Uh, we meet, we'll, to meet this trans transformational challenge, um, we need to invest in the skills and the infrastructure needed to bring circularity into agriculture and horticulture. We also need to streamline the regulatory hurdles that businesses face when wanting to adopt a circular approach. Environmental, industry and food safety standards need to keep up with the rapidly changing area of big data in agriculture and the emerging circularity based uh, enterprises, uh, for example, like insect proteins, um, which is an area that um, we're getting involved in a bit and there's, there's so many regulations associated with with insect manure, you don't know that you know, people don't know how to define insect manure in, in, in government in food standards. It's just, just, just a bit crazy. Um, COVID and the recent ge geopolitical unrest has taught us that building local supply chains in the area of energy and food is critical to, um, to sovereign security. Uh, domestic sources of fertilizers are criti critical to reducing food inflation and potential food security issues. Recently, most of the conversations that I go to um, at um, national food summits and agricultural peak industry conferences is all about sustainability. Never like before, companies big and small are rushing to develop ESG policies based on UNESCO protocols. They are they're using whatever strategies they can to capture the hearts and minds of expanding health and sustainability focused consumers. However, I believe the sustainable emperor has no clothes. Sustainable means to sustain, and we, if we maintain the status quo, we are still uh, on a path to run out of our natural resources, cook and drown ourselves in climate change, and kill our soils and water resources. Through the Nutrients in a Circular Economy Hub, working out how to capture and divert valuable plant nutrients at a local level from our waterways and oceans into nutrient-dense food, consumed close to market, moves the sustainability dial to where we need it to be, which is in an endless circular motion. Like other corporations, Yates, Julex Group, uh, we've, we've started on the sustainability journey. The Nutrients in a Circular Economy Hub provides an opportunity for Yates, Julex Group, to potentially replace some of the estimated 40,000 tonnes, for example, that goes into lawns and gardens every year with a more circular source of nutrients. However, the yuck factor of us using treated urine as a fertiliser needs to be better understood. And the same issue relates to phosphorus from struvite, for example. Uh, we will be working hard over the coming months and years to unlock the perceptions of the Australian producers and home gardeners and hopefully transform our urine-based nutrients um, into a more user-friendly uh, and change those perceptions within our communities. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for Gary for the very practical application of the, our urine fertilizer. Hope to have uh, some research translation together with the OCP. The next speaker we have uh, um, the Southeast Water, the Dr. Li Gao. Yeah, we are developing some caravan type of the mobile toilet to collect urine as well as processing inside caravans. So the Southeast Water very much keen to working on this area. So UTS, uh, we are the building lab and we have the uh, world's largest uh, urine collection with the 15 story. So we will develop the building level of the urine collection and processing. Also we have a Brisbane node, so they want to work together with Urban Utility to work together with the Victoria Park, the public toilet. So they want to collect urine at the public toilet and then apply to the Victoria Park as it is. So we have uh, three different nodes. So one of the very important, our node from the Southeast Water. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee Gao from Southeast Water.
Good morning all. My name is Li Gao from Southeast Water and uh, it is my great pleasure to be here to join this ARC Nice Hub launch. I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague, Research Development Manager, David Bergman. He's unfortunately unable to join us today due to COVID reason. He sends his sincere apologies. Before I go any further, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owner of the land on which we are meeting now, the guardian people of the Euro nation. We have so much to learn from our first people and the country they first learned to live, survive, and prosper. Southeast Water is one of Melbourne's metropolitan water retailers. We supply water, sewage, recycled water to approximately 1.9 million people. And for those who know us, our areas covers from inner city, Port Melbourne, to coastal Port Sea, and over to rural Pekinet. Every year, we produce more than 137 billion liters of drinking water, and we collect more than 108 billion liters of wastewater from our customers. From our water recycling plants, we produce more than 2,300 liters of megaliter of recycled water used for homes, business, agricultural, and urban space. We also recycle biosolids for soil improvements, and we generate by, uh, renewable energy from biogas and solars. To quote from the animated movie Shrek, circular economies <laughs> are like uh, onions. <laughs> yes, they might stink, they might make you cry, but the most probably, <coughs> But mostly, it is because they have layers. We probably all agree that circular economies are complex. They always have overlap relationship and the circularities within the circularities. So what is driving water utilities to get involved in this sticky area which could bring us to cry. Why would they move from otherwise a straightforward, simple water in, sewage out process to some complex, to something complex with more partners, more pathways, and more interdependencies, interdependencies? As evidenced from Water Services Association Australia transitioning with the circular economy paper, Water utilities' awareness is growing of their essential role they can play in circular economy. We have the water, nutrients, and other materials that are enablers and significant contributors to the circular economy in which they are located in, such as agricultural, manufacturing, landscaping, to name a few. We can no longer stand back in face of the pressures of the population groups, climate change, urbanization, and uh, resource scarcity. The need for, public, for participation in circular economy is paramount. The benefits are actually in, in, extensive from the lower cost and the high revenues for water utilities through to the affordability resilience, and the security for our customers and the community, and to the wider environmental benefits, protecting our waterways, lowering our emission, and enhancing our soil. But water utilities are not always sure how, where, and with whom to start their circular economy journey. Water utilities are looking for partners such as Nice Hub to be with us to get us through the audience of the circular economy. 
for the nice heart and its partners as part of the pathway boosters as identified by the International Water Association, such as innovation boosters, proving and demonstrating what is possible, connecting boosters to help us to engage new partners and new technologies, which is beyond the traditional boundary, the leadership booster to provide science and facts to help us boldly influence our partners and the value chain and the boosters for the new business model, providing data to support new business cases and economic models. We have a lot to learn here with you and from you. It's a privilege to be part of the nice hub. And I'm looking forward to unwrapping the audience of the circular economy with all of you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, speaker, last but not least, uh, Mr. Jeff Sewell from EIC Activities. So he will share about uh, what's the construction or some of the opportunity we can work together with the EIC and NICE Hub. Please join me by coming to Jeff Sewell. Thank you, Sean, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, very pleased to be here today representing CIMIC um, and our CEO, Pedro Vicente, who would have been here, but uh, much for other engagements. Uh, can I just add my acknowledgement of country to that of Professor Sean, and uh, also just acknowledge the distinguished guests here today. So why is CIMIC involved in uh, research and involvement with UTS and ARC. Well, the, the operating companies that make up CIMIC are uh, very heavily involved in all manner of infrastructure that goes on in Australia. And uh, we feel we have a responsibility being involved in, that, in those projects to uh, try to improve the knowledge um, of uh, materials, uh, processes, systems, uh, that go into the construction of those projects in an effort to uh, do our part to, re to reduce the amount of materials that go into them, to reuse the waste products that come out of them, and to generally reduce emissions. Uh, this will be the fourth uh, ARC and university uh, collaboration that we've been involved in over the last four years. It'll be the second one with UTS. We're very uh, pleased to be involved again. Um, and just to mention a little bit about what the CIMIC group is doing in some of those areas, um, of course we have <coughs> United Group, UGL, who are heavily involved in uh, um, solar projects, transmission line projects, uh, water and wastewater projects uh, across Australia. We have Pacific Partnerships, who have recently um, uh, bought it, which in fact, through Pacific Partnership, bought out our first solar farm as an entity to become a power provider. Um, and I guess the main area uh, that uh, EIC is interested in is our collaboration with CPB contractors. Now, for those that don't know, CPB is the, the largest general civil contractor in Australasia uh, and heavily involved across the nation in all manner of uh, civil uh, infrastructure projects. The research that we've uh, been involved in, as I mentioned before, with the other ARC projects is all directly designed to try to improve the construction techniques that go into the projects that we're involved in. So we take some responsibility for, uh, as I said, reducing waste and improving outcomes this particular one, it's not related to fertiliser, uh, it's related to something completely different, uh, but still important and still uh, you know, very much a, uh, an opportunity to do something different in an area uh, which is particularly important uh, to emissions, and that's uh, the reduction of cement and limestone that goes into the construction industry. Um, again, uh, cement production, I think, ranks at about number seven 
in the world in terms of its emissions intensity. intensity. Uh, so anything that we can do to try to reduce that is great. Uh, all of our research happens through EIC activities. We are the technical group within CIMIC. Uh, our, our engineers and technical staff are involved in these research projects. And we see that as an opportunity to bring the, uh, the practical knowledge that we have being involved in industry to combine it with the, uh, the research that goes on in the universities. As I said, our second project with UTS, uh, with Bezard and Hardy, uh, we've just finished a project uh, involved with uh, looking at opportunities to build infrastructure over the landfill, uh, and that has resulted in some really good research and, and more importantly for one of our young uh, engineers is uh, his PhD study and I think that's about to be awarded if not already been awarded. So uh, Michael Viner is one of our uh, young geotechnical engineers. We're very proud of his work. Um, it's really been quite a, an effort on his part. He's worked pretty much full time for us for four years while completing his his PhD and I can tell you we didn't let him have any free time uh, from, uh, from his normal duties so uh, we'll have to start calling him Dr Michael around the office now uh, and that work was with Bezard and, and Hardy as I said. And uh, this next um, project is, research project, is looking as, as I said to try to, uh, for opportunities to reduce cement in industry and uh, in this case um, in various parts of Australia, we build civil infrastructure with highly reactive clays. And the way you stabilise those clays, it's fairly crude, you just mix it up with cement and lime, and it turns it into something a lot more benign. Um, CQB contractors, along with our joint venture partner, have been undertaking this, the, uh, the Earthworks project for the new Western Sydney Airport here in, uh, here in Sydney, and you know, that was one of the major challenges is uh, to try to make sure that we're not throwing away material that um, typically we wouldn't use because of its uh, reactivity and improve it. Uh, and this ne next research project will look at a, a slightly novel way <laughs> of uh, finding another product which might uh, reduce that reactivity rather than just using cement. So just in, in closing, very pleased to be uh, involved again with UTS um, and we look forward to, uh, to another few years and, and potentially some more projects after that. Thank you very much.